Amen. Amen. So Numbers uh, chapter 14. Keep something there. We'll be coming back later uh, in the sermon to Numbers chapter 14. But if you would, uh, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, what I want to preach about this morning is the subject of murmuring and complaining. Murmuring and complaining. And the title actually is Neither Murmur. There's a lot of things uh, that we are admonished to do and not do in the Word of God. And one of those things is to not murmur. And if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the dark and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock which followed them, that was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now what we're reading about this morning in Numbers 14, that's what this is referring to in 1 Corinthians 10, where where God was displeased with these people because they uh, they uh, they did not believe God. They were not uh, willing to go into the promised land. It goes on there in verse 6. It says, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be adulterers as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and to rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. And it goes on there and says, verse 10, Neither murmur ye, as some, of, uh, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now we're going to see this morning that, that, that this uh, subject of murmuring is something that they were very guilty of. It's something they did often. And we read a lot of these other sins that they were guilty of there. You know, the fornication, the idolatry, the rising up to drink and to play, uh, tempting Christ, all these things, to the point where they were destroyed of the serpent, they were destroyed of the destroyer. You know, and we read there in Numbers 14 how they were held back from going into the promised land. And one of those things that are mentioned here that, that was a, a grievance to God, that God was displeased about uh, with them over, was the fact that they murmured. So we kind of might kind of overlook that, that a little bit and say, well, you know, murmuring might not really, you know, be as bad as some of these other sins that these guys were guilty of. But it's listed here. And it's something that we see that God takes note of in the scripture and it says here that God recorded these things happening all these things that happened to the children of Israel numbers 14 is there why because verse 11 where it says now all these things happened unto them for in samples and they are written for our admonition admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come so we read about these things in numbers 14 and elsewhere in the, in the old testament because they're there for our admonition they're there to remind us to admonish us to encourage us to warn us these things are written for us today and one of those things that we are to take note of in the Old Testament is that we are not to be murmurers. We are not to murmur. There, are, you know, like, as I said, there are many things that we're commanded to do and not to do in Scripture, isn't there? And the text tells us here to not murmur, neither murmur. And why is it? Why is it that we should not murmur? Why should we sit up this morning and pay attention and listen to the sermon and, and take note of the fact that we are not to be murmurers? Today? It's because murmuring has serious consequences. I mean, very serious consequences, and that's what we're going to see this morning. It's important that we understand what murmuring is and what it isn't so that we're not guilty of it. You know, we, we all have an idea of what we might think it is, but it's actually a little bit more specific. You know, a lot of people would uh, lump it in with complaining, and I do believe it's a form of complaining, but I believe there's also a difference between murmuring and complaining. And if you would, uh, just turn over to Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7. You see, complaining is something that we're probably, that's a, a word we're probably a little bit more familiar with this morning. You know, some of us more than others, maybe. Right? We're, we're, we know what complaining is when somebody's, uh, you know, making objections. We might even call it whining a little bit. That's something that we would kind of call complaining. And here's the thing, though. Complaining, when I read the scriptures, I see that sometimes complaining is legitimate. That there are times when a person can express their own uh, grief, their own, they can lament their circumstances in a way that the Bible would call complaining. So what we call complaining today, or we might consider complaining, where someone's just, you know, being whiny and just objecting and just, you know, boo-booing about not getting their way, we would say that person is complaining. And that's not an attribute that we really want, but really what that is, what we would call complaining today, I believe the Bible would refer more to as murmuring. Because a complaint often is something that can be very legitimate. I mean, you think about it, sometimes you go into, uh, you know, a restaurant, they want to know if you have any compliments or complaints. You know, there might some places they have the complaint box, right? And you can, they, you, you would get the manager, why? So, if you had bad service somewhere, you would complain to them. Why? They want to hear those complaints because they're legitimate. Because there really is a problem here that needs to be addressed. So complaining in the scripture 
is a little different than murmuring in the sense that complaining often is something that's legitimate. And you see that with Job there. Look, Job had reason to complain, didn't he? I mean, Job lost all of his wealth. Job lost all of his children. Uh, he, he was afflicted in his flesh. I mean, he, was, he went through a lot. And it says there in Job chapter 7, verse 1, Is there not an appointed time to man upon the earth? Are not his days also like the days of an hireling, and as a servant earnestly desireth the shadow, and as an hireling looketh for the reward of his work? So I am made to possess months of vanity, and wearisome nights are appointed unto me. When I lay down, I say, When shall I arise and the night be gone? I am full of tossings to and fro and the dawning of the day. So Job in this in his uh, you know in his affliction was complaining even of being alive. I mean, in, in other portions we would read where he says, you know, what, he would what he want to be born. He wanted the knees to prevent him. You know, he, and he didn't even want to be born. That's how serious and bitter his complaint was. Look there in verse 5, it says, My flesh is clothed with worms and clods of dust. My skin is broken and become loathsome. I mean, this guy is not in a good way. This, he didn't just stub his toe. You know, he's not just complaining because he's in heavy traffic or something like that. He's really going through something in life. And, and he's got a reason to complain. That's why it says there in verse 11, Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. And the Bible says of Job that all the things he spoke concerning the Lord were right. And he wasn't rebuked for complaining. So there is a time when complaining is legitimate. But often it's when we're expressing our own uh, troubles, things that we're going through. Uh, you know, someone might ask you how it's going, and if you're just brutally honest with them sometimes, you, you would probably be complaining. You know, if we're really going through something in life, we would, we would say, like, hey, it's not going well. And I believe that's what we could call complaining in the Scripture. Now today... You know, we call complaining what I believe the Bible would describe as murmuring. And that's where, what would be the difference is that, you know, complaining is, is kind of bemoaning one's own circumstances. That's what we saw with Job, right? He's complaining in the bitterness of his spirit. Why? There, he says, therefore, I will complain in the bitterness of my spirit. Why? Because, he, as it says there, his flesh is clothed with worms and clods of dust. His skin is broken. I mean, he's really going through it. So there are times when complaining is legitimate, where it's something that's, you know, to be expected at least where it's not something that God is going to come down on. But the Bible does say that we are not to be murmurers. And uh, <clears throat> murmuring, I believe, is different than complaining in the fact that it's not legitimate. It's illegitimate complaining, I guess you could call it. It's illegitimate and it's dangerous uh, for several reasons. And murmuring, you know, it often you will know, take on the form as an attack on another. And that's what we're going to see in the Scriptures a lot. Is when the children of Israel were murmuring, what they were doing is they were laying blame on somebody else. They were pointing the finger and saying, it's your fault that we're in this position. And they were attacking somebody else. I mean, we read there where they wanted to take them and stone them with stones. Yep. They, they, didn't even, they wanted to express how upset they were about things to the point that they were willing to kill somebody else. So murmuring is illegitimate and dangerous. And murmuring is something that often takes on the form as an attack on another person or a group of people. And really where murmuring comes from is, is from an ungrateful attitude. It's somebody who is not grateful, they're not thankful, they don't understand what's been done for them often, they don't, they don't appreciate the things that they have, and they can take those things for granted, and they can get to this place in their life where they begin to murmur. And that's what we see with these children of Israel. And murmuring, what's dangerous about murmuring is that not only will it get you in hot water with the Lord, and maybe even other authorities in your life, but murmuring is something that it is an attitude that can spread to others. And really, that's what we we see in the scriptures, especially with the children of Israel, is that they're murmuring and they're they're murmuring and complaining. They're illegitimate complaining. They're murmuring is something that spread to the to the rest of the congregation. Now, if you would uh, turn over to Exodus chapter sixteen, Exodus chapter six. Actually, go to Exodus fifteen. Excuse me, Exodus fifteen. I'll read you from Exodus sixteen where we see this. This all three of these attributes in murmuring. It says, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And you know, this is where they're coming out from Egypt at first. They're going in, you know, they're going to, they haven't even gotten to Jordan yet. And they're running into places where there is no water. And they begin to, to, to desire the leeks and onions of Egypt. They're, they're, they're complaining against Moses and against Aaron. And it says there in Exodus 16, verse 2, the whole congregation. So murmuring is an attitude that spreads to other people. When one person has a bad attitude and a bad spirit, and they start to vocalize that, some, sometimes a lot of other people will say, you know, you're right. We should be upset about that. But the next thing you know, that person is repeating that same complaint. That person is now murmuring. And then it spreads to the next person, to the point where you can have an entire congregation, as we saw here in Exodus, 
that are murmuring against Moses and Aaron. So, far, so much so that they're, they're murmuring against the very men that brought them out of Egypt, that delivered them from bondage. The very men that are to be their leaders, the, man, the, the men of God in their life, they're even murmuring against them. And what murmuring does to us, this attitude, is, is that it blinds us to the blessings. It blinds us to the blessings that we have in our life. It blinds us to the things that God has done in our life and the working that He's done in our life. And if you would, if you're there in Exodus chapter 15, look at verse 20, it says, and of course this is the, the song, right? The, 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 they sing this song in Exodus 15. They talk about the great works that God has done, how He you know, split the Red Sea. And it says there in Exodus chapter 15, verse 20, And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dances. And Miriam answered, saying, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed uh, gloriously. The horse and his rider uh, hath he thrown into the sea. So we see some people have the right attitude. We see some people here are, you know, they're glad about the things that have happened. I mean, this just took place. I mean, they're excited about the fact that God has defeated their enemy, that he brought in the waters upon them and cast down the rider. He has delivered them from that uh, that land of bondage. And, you know, really at this point in the story of Israel, they've just experienced one of, if not, you know, this could be debatable, if not the greatest miracle in the Old Testament. Yeah. I mean, we go to, we're going to sit here and start laming off some of the great uh, miracles that we see in the Old Testament. I mean, splitting the Red Sea has got to be up there. I mean, we're, we're talking top five, top right. three, if not number one. It, that was a big deal. I mean, not to mention all the miracles that he did in their sight in Egypt when he delivered them with all the plagues yeah. and all the different things he brought upon them there. And then he brings them out of Egypt and they even spoil the Egyptians. I mean, they take their jewels with them. And God delivers them with a mighty hand and he does this great miracle in their sight. And But what happens is they get their eyes on the circumstances that they find themselves in and they begin to murmur and they begin to forget about everything that just took place. And this is something that plagues them throughout the rest of their existence. So murmuring has this tendency to blind people. Why is it that people even get this attitude? Why is it that people even get to the place in their life where they start to murmur, where they start to complain and blame others for their, for their uh, circumstances? It's because they, they don't take the time to be grateful and understand the blessings that they have in their life. Yeah. You know, Israel just experiences the Red Sea crossing, but I'll here look at verse 22 of the same chapter, just a few verses later. I mean, it's a few verses after we see Miriam dancing with the timbrel with the women and, and just praising and rejoicing. And giving glory to God, then you see in verse 22, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went in the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Now, humanly speaking, we can look at this and say, Well, I mean, this is millions of people. They have women, children there. they got families, even... You know, yeah, what are they going to drink? That, 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 that sounds like a legitimate complaint. But you have to remember what they just saw. Yeah. Everything they just went through. I mean, w would you really be that surprised? I mean, God can split the Red Sea and deliver you, but He can't, he can't give you, He can't furnish a table in the wilderness in the presence of your enemies? Mm -hmm. I mean, they should have known better. They really should have known better. But what do they do? They, they're blinded to the blessings that they just had. They're blinded to the miracles because they have an attitude that's quick to murmur. An attitude that's just quick to look at the circumstances they're in and, not, and forget God and just to complain and to murmur. So they have quickly forgotten the Lord's miracles. And they're instantly, you know, it's not just that they're complaining, it's that they're murmuring in the sense that they're murmuring against Moses. You know, their complaint is being directed at somebody. There's a blame being involved. They're saying, it's your fault. You know, you brought us out into the wilderness to die. It would be better that we had stayed in Egypt. And they actually say that at one point in their journey. They say that it would have been better for them to stay in Egypt. It's like they forget how bad they had it in Egypt. Ouch. And this, this, uh, this, this, this attitude of murmuring is something that will blind us to the blessings that God has given us. And these people, they quickly forget the miracles, and they begin attacking, and they begin murmuring. Look at verse 25. And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he had cast into the, into the waters, uh, the waters were made sweet. There he made them for, uh, for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. So... It's not like God didn't know where he was going. It's not like God was like, oh, whoops, I forgot. You guys need to drink water. Right. You're not like me. You know, he, he, it's not like he forgot that. It says he did that because he was proving them. Yeah. To see what their attitude would be like. To see what kind of people they were. To kind of, And really, he already knew that. I mean, God knows all these things. 
And he, and he kind of, I think when God proves people like that, he really is trying to show them what they're like. Yeah. He's really trying to show them that they're stiff-necked. He's trying to show them that they murmur, that they're the ones who have a bad attitude. Yeah. So we see here that Israel, they murmured and they failed to, to, to learn the lesson that God was trying to teach them. That God had, has got them. That God will provide for them. That God can, can give them water out of dry ground. That God can open up uh, the fountains of heaven. So we see this going on, and really what we can apply this in our own life and understand from this is that you know, difficult circumstances that we might find ourselves in our life, whether they be you know, financial or physical or spiritual or all the different difficulties that we can run into in life, those just might be engineered by God. I'm not saying they always are. I'm not saying every time you come into something in your life that you know, it's God trying to work something in your life, but never rule that out. Maybe we should always step back and say, well, what is God trying to teach me here? Yeah. What, what is it that I'm supposed to be learning? What is it, you know, it might just be that, you know, you're reaping what you sow and you just need to learn that lesson. Right. You know, that if, if you go into debt, you're going to have a hard time getting out of debt. And these kind of simple lessons in life, but we should be always careful that when we run into difficult circumstances in life, that we don't discount the fact that perhaps those circumstances were engineered by God. I mean, that's what we see here when they go to the waters of Mara. God led them there. He knew the waters were better. And he led them there to prove them. And all it took was Moses throwing in the tree and making the water sweet again. But often when we go into those places, those we find ourselves in bitter waters, when we find ourselves in Mara, God has led us there into these difficult circumstances. We need to ask ourselves, is God trying to teach us something? Is he trying to teach us something that will benefit us? And what he's probably trying to teach the children of Israel is that they shouldn't murmur. Because we see that this attitude escalates. And it leads to the point where, where God has to punish them severely. It says there in verse 26, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of, thy Lord, of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have bought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. God's trying to teach them something. God's trying to show them something. Like, I, I can provide for you, and if you will simply obey and listen and do my commandments, I'm going to protect you. I'm not going to let the same things happen to you that happened to the Egyptians. Amen. But what murmuring does is it blinds us to the past blessings. It blinds us to the fact that God delivered us from Egypt. It blinds us to the fact that God miraculously helped us cross the Red Sea. And it blinds us to the present. It blinds us to the present blessings that God is able to make those bitter waters sweet right in our very presence. Yeah. And it will also blind us to the fact that God has even future blessings for us. As he says there, if you can obey me, if you do what I say, I will put none of these diseases upon you. I will bless you, he's saying there. I'm not going to curse you, I'm going to bless you. But you have, we have to do that with uh, you know, foresight in mind. We have to do that thinking ahead, looking ahead and understanding that when we come into difficult circumstances, the answer is not to murmur. The answer is not to say, well, it's so-and-so's fault, it's somebody else's fault, and start to have this bad attitude of murmuring. It says there in verse 27, and when they came and they came to Elam, there were twelve walls of water and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped by the waters. So God leads them to this to these to these uh, these palm trees. I and mean, they're out there, they're they're thirsty, they can't get a drink. God teaches them this lesson, and then he leads them to this future blessing. He says, Look, if you have the right attitude, you know, you don't I've taken care of you so far. So we, can, we don't want to get blind to the, to the well of water that, that's waiting for us as well. We don't want to be blind to the 12 palm trees, right? We want to see that ahead in our life and understand that God will lead us to, uh, you know, there might be difficult circumstances along the way in our lives, but let's not get an attitude of murmuring and forget about what God has done for us, what God can do for us, and what God will do for us. Amen. So that is one of the dangers of murmuring, is that it blinds you to the fact that God can, has, and will bless us. Now, the other danger that we have to look out for, what's so dangerous about murmuring, is that murmuring can become habitual. It's something that people just fall into. And I think we're all so prone to this. This is something that we all have to be on guard on, about. We will start to complain about some of the dumbest things. I mean, we'll start to complain about just the littlest things. I mean, we'll be, we'll, sometimes if we get the wrong attitude, I mean, we could be in the midst of, of blessings and something just doesn't go just the way we want it and we've got to let somebody know about it. You know, and I'm not trying to pick on people or anything like that, but I deal with people a lot, well, especially lately with these, with these res trips and things like that. We're always trying to accommodate people. And it's just funny to me sometimes how people, and I'm not down on them for it, I have the same problem at times too, even, even on the same res trips. Go figure. They'll, they'll say, well, why, why, why this? 
you know, why do we have to eat a hotel breakfast? You know, I, I, I say, you know, did, did you, did, you know, or have, have you so so soon forgotten the, the the factory pizza? You know, don't you not the Panera that waits for you? You know, where you got to just endure this one meal of, of Belgian waffles and syrup. You know, and, and you know, it's, but people have these little, and I don't think we even realize we're doing it. That it's, and I wouldn't say that's like a, a terrible, you know, bitter complaint. Yeah, that that's just. We tend to murmur a little bit. We tend, right. well, why couldn't this just be a little bit better? Right. You know, why couldn't we get the queen size bed instead of the standard? Now, I would agree with that complaint. That was a little bit was better rough. But anyway, that's my murmuring, right? I had a little murmuring when I woke up that morning and all stiff. <laughs> but murmuring can become habitual to the point where we just, just a knee jerk reaction, we just murmur at the drop of a hat. One little thing doesn't go right. We think things could be a little bit better here. And we're just quick to remind somebody else of, hey, why this? Or did you ever consider? Can't this be better? Why do we have to do this? Or why do we have to do that? Right. And that's the problem with murmuring is that it becomes habitual to the point where we do it without even thinking about it. Yeah. And if you would, turn over to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. We'll see a little bit of this. That's what happened to the children of Israel. God leads them out, blesses them. He has every intent of blessing them every step along the way. And he's going to protect them, care for them. But they fall into murmuring, you know, right out of the gate. And it just, from there on out, they just murmur, murmur, murmur all the way through. And it escalates and becomes worse. And then God has to deal with it. So murmuring can become habitual. That's one of its dangers. Look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. And they took their journey for Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel uh, came unto the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So, as soon as they're away, you know, they just left these this nice place where there's the water and the palm trees, and they're out in the wilderness again, the same situation that they found themselves in before, and they begin to murmur against uh, Moses and against Aaron. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. I mean, talk about getting a bad attitude. Talk about, you know, just not being grateful. That God has delivered them from such bondage that they were in in Egypt. And now they're saying it would be better for them to have died. After God has already proven to them in the wilderness, not to mention everything He's already done for them in the land of Egypt and coming out of Egypt, that they're so quick to just murmur and to complain. And why is it that they're complaining? It says, And when we did eat bread to the full, for He had brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly of hunger. They're saying, you brought us out here to kill us. That was what this whole thing was about. That's why you did all those miracles and killed all those Egyptians and spoiled them and split the Red Sea and provide, you know, and miraculously deliver us. But you just brought us out here to kill us. What a stupid complaint. Yeah. What, a, what a bad attitude they have. But this is where murmuring leads. You know, first it's, oh, I'm thirsty. So you give them water. Now it's like, oh, I'm hungry. You know, it's like the kids on the road trip, right? <laughs> I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. You give them water. I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Then you feed them. Now it's, I have to go to the bathroom. You know, this kind of reminds you of that, that road trip a little bit. But that's been, to a greater degree. Of course, they're never going to be like, you brought us out here to kill us. <laughs> like, go to an amusement park. What are you talking about? So, but that's, that's where murmuring leads, is where it just becomes habitual. If it's not one thing, it's another. Oh, you gave us water, but now we're hungry. You, know, and you brought us out here to kill us. See, they'd already forgotten the 12 wells of water. You know, just, just as they had forgotten the miracles of Egypt and the Red Sea. And the murmuring becomes so severe to the point where they're desiring to die. Where they're saying it would be better for us to have died in Egypt. Hmm. And uh, here's the thing, though, we've got to understand is that God lets us go through smaller struggle, struggles sometimes to prepare us for bigger ones. I mean, sometimes He'll let us go through this, you know, we might have to go through Mara because maybe we're going to find ourselves a little bit farther out in the wilderness. Or we're going to really need to lean on God. And really look for Him to provide for us and trust us. But we have to learn those little lessons along the way to where we will, won't have this habitual, just instinctive nature of just instantly complaining, just instantly murmuring against God, just instantly you know, uh, pointing the finger, trying to blame somebody else, when our action should be, let's pray. Let's ask God to help us. I mean, what if they had just stopped where they were and said, well, you know, God's got this. God could take care of us. I mean, isn't that what we saw? where we read in Numbers 14 this morning with Caleb and uh, Joshua, where they came back and said, you know, God is for us. You know, don't be afraid of the Amorites. God's going to deliver us from these people. There was only two that came back with the good report. But they understood that. They had learned this lesson back here. They learned all these lessons that God can give water 
where it's, the water is better. That God, God can lead you to the wells in the wilderness. That God can feed you with manna from heaven. They had already learned the lessons to trust. The what Now they're ready to go to Jordan. That's, that's a big uh, task ahead of them. But they've learned all these little lessons along the way. And they're not going to be quick to murmur. They're, you know, they're going to be quick to, to pray and look for God to help them. So God will often lead us through smaller struggles, struggles to prepare us for bigger ones. And, uh, you know, Israel one day uh, would face um, not just facing hunger and thirst, but they were going to face nations that were bigger and mightier than them. I mean, they were going to go defeat entire kingdoms. They were going to go out and wipe out kings and, and all the inhabitants of that land. I mean, they had a big task ahead of them, and God is trying to prove them and prepare them along the way to develop an attitude of not murmuring, but of trust. Not of complaining, but of looking to God for provision and protection. So God's trying to teach them along the way. But what do they do? They murmur. They don't get the lesson. They don't learn it. And here's the thing. You know, murmuring doesn't fall in deaf ears. Murmuring, God hears murmuring. And God takes note of murmuring. And God deals with murmuring. And that's really what makes it especially dangerous. Is that we should be afraid to murmur because God will hear it. Yeah. And God will deal with it. And uh, if you would, look at verse 7 there. It says, And in the morning... Then shall ye see the glory of the Lord, for he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? So they're murmuring against Moses and Mary. He said, well, you know what? God hears you. And you're not murmuring against us. You might think you are. You know, that's something we ought to be careful about when we start to say it's so-and-so's fault. Yeah. We might not even realize who it is we're really complaining against. You know, and then, you know, we could all probably apply that in our lives. You know, sometimes we might complain about something, you know, that we don't like that's going on in the church. And the pastor could do this, or the pastor could do that. Well, are you really murmuring against the pastor? Or, you know, why, why, is, why do we have to have this standard? Why do we have to, you know, believe that about the Bible? Well, are you sure that's who you're complaining about? Yeah. That, you're, that you're murmuring against the pastor? Because you might be murmuring against God. And then you're, that, that's hot water. Yeah. And, you know, the pastor will say, well, who am I? You know, I'm just preaching the book. I'm just telling you what it says. You do with it what you will. But if you're going to get a bad attitude about it, you need to understand that it's not me that you're complaining against, but it's against God Himself. Yeah. You know, parent or children can have the same problem with parents. You know, kids have to understand that you know if they're going to say, "Well, I love God, I obey, I'm going to obey God, I'm going to do what God says." Well, then you're going to obey your parents because that's the authority in your life. And then they start to complain about their parents and whine and complain about their parents and murmur against them and say it's their fault or why do we have to do that or they don't know what they're doing. You are murmuring against God. Yeah. So we have to be careful about this in our lives because murmuring is dangerous because ultimately when you're murmuring against authority in your life, you're murmuring against God and He hears it. And if you would, keep something there, but turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. <clears throat> you see, a lot of times uh, people murmur to one another. They'll find somebody else who they think will listen to their, their bitter complaint. You know, they'll, they'll find somebody who give them an ear and let them fill it with their memory. And it'll spread, it'll become habitual. But a lot of times people kind of murmur in their own heart. Or they'll just murmur with their own family. Or maybe just a real close friend. It won't be something that they try to spread. It'll just be something that they keep a little bit more private. But, let, but mark it down, God hears that. It's not just the murmuring that you do in public. It's just not the murmuring that you're willing to just voice whenever to whoever. You know, the murmuring that you do in your own heart, even God hears these things. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 1, look at verse 20, And I said unto you, You are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord God hath given to us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land that before thee to go up, go up and possess it, as the Lord thy God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. And he came near unto me every one of you and said, well, uh, We will send men before us, and we will search out the land and bring us word again, well, by what way we must go up, and to what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve of you, and uh, one of a tribe, and he turned and went up and, into the mountain, and he came unto the valley of Eshcol, and searched it out, and took of the fruit of the, uh, the land in their hands, and brought it down unto us, and brought us word again, it said, It is a good land which the Lord God, God our, doth give us. Notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of, your, of the Lord your God. And he murmured in your tents. And said, Because the Lord hated us, and brought us forth out of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. So here it is in the story where, God, where, where, where Moses is kind of rehearsing everything that's taken place thus far. And he's reminding them of what had happened, how the, how the, tri, the, the spies went in, and then they come back, and then they had the evil report. 
and they, they influence the people to, to, to go into their tents and what do they do? They murmur. But they're murmuring privately. They're doing it just themselves and it's that same stupid complaint that I had earlier that God's trying to destroy them. That God's doing all this. God's going to all this trouble and dealing with them and putting up with them just so that he could do evil to them. Which makes no sense at all. But notice where they're doing it. They're doing it in their tents. And they're doing it privately. So God hears murmuring. Whether it's private, whether it's public, God hears it and God deals with it because God understands how bad murmuring can get. I mean, it can get completely out of hand. Turn back to Exodus chapter 16 if you kept something there. Exodus chapter 16, look at verse 8. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord God give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings which you murmur against Him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So God understands that people, they start thinking they're just murmuring about a situation. They're just murmuring about some kind of difficulty in their life. Now they're murmuring against an individual. They're murmuring against an authority. And whether it leads us to they end up murmuring against God. And what do they end up doing when a person can get to the point where the murmuring just gets so habitual, so out of hand, so uncorrected, they begin to charge God foolishly. And they say, because the Lord God hated us. That's why he brought us up. Because God hates us. And that doesn't just happen overnight. Where the people get to the point where they're just bitter against God. And they just are angry against God. That's a progression. That's, oh, I'm thirsty. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, God's here to kill us. You know, we're not going into the land. And we're in our tents. And we're going to complain about it. Go to Exodus chapter 17, verse 3. <sighs> It says in Exodus chapter 17, verse 3, And the Lord thirsted there for water, and, and the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is it that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? I mean, this murmuring is just getting completely out of hand. Right. To the point where they're charging God foolishly. They're charging the men of God foolishly, saying, You're just trying to kill us. But here's the thing this is why murmuring is so dangerous, because it escalates to a point where God. He's hearing it. He's putting up with it. He's giving you opportunity to correct it, to change your attitude, until it gets to the point where God has to deal with it. Where God has to come down and He has to deal with people who murmur. And that's where we saw it in Numbers chapter 14. And if you would, go back there, Numbers chapter 14. God deals with murmuring. God hears it. And God only puts up with it for so long. <laughs> And God deals with it here in Numbers chapter 14, look at verse 1. It says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would that God, uh, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness, wherefore hath, thou, hath the Lord brought us into this land, to fall by the sword, and our wives and our children should be a prey? Were not better for us to return unto, into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Look at verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it, will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them, and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. And Moses had said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for thou brought us up this people in thy might from among them. God gets so sick of their murmuring, he's ready to just wipe them out. God gets, I mean, murmuring is dangerous. I mean, murmuring can take you to a place in your life where God's ready to just destroy you. So you know I've had enough. And he's just gonna he's just gonna end your life. Or just bring such severe chastisement that's gonna just affect you for the rest of your life and it's never going to be the same. That's where God was with these people. I mean they and the, you know to whosoever much is given shall so much also be required. When they started to learn to see to see God work in their lives and understood who it is that they're dealing with, you know, God you know, his uh, his his uh, temper probably got a little a little shorter with him. You know, that, that wick on that, that uh you know, explosive got a little shorter. That fuse got a little shorter with them. <clears throat> to a point where he's ready to just wipe them out. But of course, we know the story. Moses talks him down. He says, no, no, don't do that. Unless the heathen here. And it wasn't because Moses felt so bad for them. It wasn't because Moses was like, they're not that bad. Moses knew how bad they were. And he even complained about them. Yes. And said, you know, they're, they're stiff-necked people, you know. And I carried them as a nursemaid, you know. And he, he had... He, he kind of complains a little bit to God and says, you know, why, why, have you, why have you vexed me with these people? Why have you given me this burden to bear these people? And their murmurings and their complainings. But Moses talks them down, but it's not for 
because he loves him so much. It's because he cares about the name of God. He didn't want God's name to be blasphemed among the heathen. And he says in verse 17, And now I beseech thee, let the power of the, uh, my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty and visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generations. Pardon, I beseech thee, iniquity of this people, according to the, unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now, the Lord has said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Verse 26, And the Lord spake unto Moses and, and, uh, spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear this e with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. And, I, and say, say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as he hath spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. They're saying, oh, it would be better if we were, we were better off dead. God says, so be it. And that's where murmuring can take you. Oh, it's so bad in my life. This and that. Okay, you can have it then. If, you're not, if you can't see where God's trying to take you or what lesson God's trying to teach you and all you can do is murmur and complain, God just might give you that. And they're saying, well, you brought us out here to kill us. That's the complaint. That's the, that's the false charge they're bringing against God. It says, all right, well, fine. Well, we'll, we'll just, since you're so convinced of that, so be it. And he says there, uh, verse 29, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to the whole number from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless you shall not come into land which I have sworn, uh, swear to make you to dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which you, you said should I be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, and ye shall and shall ye bear your iniquities even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I have said, I the Lord have said, and I will surely do it unto this evil congregation that are gathered against uh, together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there shall they fall, uh, shall they die. Verse thirty six. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him. So again, you see, it was something that was taught them. It was certain men came back, that murmuring spread into a, a whole congregation. Those evil men that uh, uh, did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. Now, I wonder when they were all the way back in Mara, at Mara, when they first complained about that water, first complain that there was nothing to drink if they would have ever understood the severity of such an attitude of where it could have, where it was going to lead them in their lives of this attitude of just murmuring and just it's never good enough what's God doing why do I have to do this look where it led them do you think they would have murmured like that if they'd known where it would have led them right. if they could have seen their carcasses being wasted in the wilderness having wandered 40 years till they were all dead hmm. You know, those men that went over and brought over an evil report, I wonder if they had known, hey, if we do this and we come back, God, we're going to die of the plague. I mean, we're going to be the first ones that get off by the Lord. I wonder if they would have gone into that land with a bit of a different attitude. Right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work that way in life. You know, you can't, you can't say, well, I'm going to behave because, you know, I, I already know the outcome. You know, we need to have an attitude that says, I'm not going to murmur because God hates it, because God hears it, because it spreads, because it's dangerous, because it's something... That it shows a heart and a spirit of ingratitude, right. uh, and, it, and it will blind me to the blessings that God has given me. And these people here, they are our example. They are our word of warning. That's what we read in First Corinthians chapter ten. And if you would uh, turn over to Philippians chapter two, Philippians chapter two. See, God doesn't take murmuring lightly because He knows what it leads to, and that's why He deals with it severely. He knows that maybe today you're just murmuring about the waters tomorrow, but when you get to the real battle, when things are really tough in life, when you get into real difficult circumstances, you've already developed a, a habit of being a murmurer, it's going to cost you. And God deals with murmuring because, one, it attacks others. That's one thing we saw. Murmuring is not just, I'm just going to, you know, um, just express, you know, my own uh, personal dissatisfaction about something. I'm actually going to blame my difficult circumstances, or whatever it is I disapprove of, I'm going to say it's so-and-so's fault. Just like the children of Israel. They, they murmured against Moses. They murmured against Aaron. 
And they even went so far to murmur against God himself. It attacks others. It shows ungratefulness. It spreads. That's why God doesn't take it lightly. And if you're in Philippians, you know, say, well, what, what's, what's the application this morning? Well, what do we do? How do we avoid this? Well, Philippians chapter 2 gives us some preventative measures that we can take to make sure that we don't turn into murmuring people who are just so quick at the drop of a hat to just complain about things. It says there in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So, there's this idea of starting out in these first few verses of being of one mind, of one accord, of esteeming the other better than yourself. You see, if we all share the same purpose and we work together and we all have that in mind, if we all have the same goal, we're going to look at, we'll look out for one another. You know, we're not going to be like the ten that come back and say, well, we don't, we're scared of that land. So let's make sure, let's turn everybody else against uh, Moses and against, uh, you know, Caleb and Jephuni, or, or Caleb and, uh, um, it's escaping you now. The two good spies. Joshua. I can't believe that one. I can't remember that one. But he's saying, be of one mind. You'll have the same goal. That's a, that's a good preventative measure to not turn into a murmur. When you're more concerned about other people's well-being. You know, maybe you're in some difficult situation, but, you know, you're more concerned about what's going on with somebody else. You take your mind off your own problems. If you're not so focused on yourself, if you're more concerned about other people, maybe you won't be so quick to murmur. He says there in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. And he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. So there's another tip to not become a murmurer, is just to be obedient. You know, he says there, uh, he, he, became in the, he took upon him the form of a servant. You know, somebody who's under the authority of another, somebody who's there to serve other people, who has somebody else in mind. <clears throat> and that took obedience, didn't it? And if we'd have that same attitude, I mean, think about it at work. Or if you, or if maybe you're somebody who employs others. Are you really going to put up with murmuring and complaining? And it's the guy that's complaining all the time. You know, we work too much. Why don't we get more days off? I don't get paid enough. Who's just always complaining. Those are the guys that end up getting let go. Those are the guys that end up getting cut loose. If things get tight, you know, and the company's got a downsize, and the guys that are always complaining, the ones that are always just, you know, murmuring against the boss and just complaining about the way things are, they're the ones that, that, that uh, you know, get the ax first. But if we were servants, if we were somebody who was being obedient, somebody who was just trying to be a blessing to others, those are the people that get kept around. So being obedient, you know, being of one mind, these are things, if we had these attitudes and we're esteeming others better than ourselves, we're not going to be so quick to murmur and complain about our own difficult circumstances. No. You know, I, I hate to use this cliche statement, but it's kind of been something I've said several times so far this year. It could be worse, right? That's kind of the theme so far, you know. Yeah. Everything that's gone on with this year has like, been pretty rough, you know, in some, in some instances. We've, we've gone through some things, but we always have to remind ourselves, well, it could be worse. Yeah, man. You know, if we had that attitude of, man, I, you know, I got I to gotta do this or I got to do that, and I'm not, I'm not really looking forward to it, well, it could be worse. You know, you could be in a lot worse uh, state, uh, situation. And so if you had that attitude, you know, you'd be less likely to complain. complain. Look at verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always uh, obey, obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He said, him, look, you need to have this attitude, not when I'm present, but when I'm absent. And it just reminds me of the fact that, you know, God hears the murmuring in the public, but he hears it just as much in private. And when we think we're alone and no one's going to hear our complaining and no one's going to hear our murmuring in our hearts when we're private, God hears that too. You know, just because you're absent from some other person, you, know, you still need to have that right attitude. Because that attitude, I mean, it all stems from within. It all comes in from within. Just it starts in the heart and then it works its way out. Yeah. He says there in verse 13, For it is God which work within you, both to do and to go, uh, will of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. 
They may be blameless to harmless to sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom he shine as lights in the world. So there's a purpose in having the right attitude. And he's admonishing them to you know, be of one mind, to, to be obedient, to be servants, to look on not every man on his own things, but on the things of others, and to, and to fear not only in his presence, but in his absence, and to, to, to do all these things, but there's a purpose behind it. It's not just, uh, just because it's the right thing to do, but God has a purpose. There's a reason why God doesn't want us being murmurous today. Why? So that we can be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. He wants us to shine as lights in the world. And if, if, you know, if we have that right attitude, that's what we're going to do. You know, people will be, will be different. Because people today, they complain about everything. I mean, to complaining is just something that just goes on all the time. I mean, just go on YouTube and look up public freakout compilation. You know, <laughs> people are just like at Taco Bell. You took three minutes longer than the last time. They'll get up on the counter and start throwing drinks. I mean, people go out of control today. <laughs> they lose their minds over the stupidest things. Sure, yeah. You think they're shining lights in the world as the sons of God without rebuke in the world? Mm. No, of course not. I mean, and then God doesn't want his people being like that. Just walking around having a bad attitude. Just the first person that they can just let have it, they're going to do it. And just tell them how, why everything's wrong, why everything isn't good enough, and just have this murmuring attitude. There is a purpose in having a right attitude. It's to shine as lights in the world. He says there in verse 16, Hold forth the word, uh, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We need to hold on to the Bible. If you don't want to be a murmurer this morning, you don't want to have God have to come down on you and, 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 and deal with your murmuring, and have a, you want to have a right attitude, you want to shine as lights in the world today, well then you need to hold forth the word of life. You, know, you need to get in your Bible and stay in it. And not only that, you need to live it. And if we would just start obeying God, keeping His commandments, doing the things that He wants us to do with the right attitude, you know, we're not going to be murmurers, but we're going to be people that God can bless. And I trust that's what we all want this morning. Let's go ahead and pray.